All right, it's time for our post break um, session with Holly Holt Torres and Andrew Cummings. So I want to introduce both of them and um, we'll go Holly, then Andrew, but I'll introduce everyone first. This session is we passed an ordinance, now what? Peer City approaches to monitoring and enforcement. So um, I really want to thank Holly and Andrew for being here today. Holly Holt Torres is the water conservation manager for the city of Dallas. It's the ninth largest city in the US. They've become a leader in conservation in North Texas region by offering a diverse menu of incentive-based programs and award-winning regional and local public awareness campaigns. Uh, Andrew Cummings is the manager for the Environmental Affairs Department at New Braunfels Utilities. He has helped further MBU's goals in emphasizing water conservation in the community. MBU adopted no more than twice per week watering in 2019, I believe. They have a lot of experience in doing monitoring and enforcement because they're on the Edwards Aquifer and lots of um, experience with that through drought. But now it is an everyday way of life for folks that are served by New Braunfels Utilities. Uh, with that, I will pass the mic to Holly and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, as Jennifer said, my name is Holly Holt Torres. I am the water conservation manager for the great city of Dallas. Um, and I'm pleased to be here with you today to discuss um, the water conservation ordinance in the city of Dallas, how it sort of has evolved over the years and how we enforce it. Next slide, please. Uh, first, I'd like to give you a brief history of water conservation in the city of Dallas. Uh, so water conservation has been a focus of the city of Dallas since the 1980s. At that time, it was largely um, education and outreach. In 2001, the city of Dallas adopted its first irrigation ordinance, which included time of day watering. Um, we also uh, created a conservation rate tier and we began our first public awareness campaign. The Water Conservation Division was formally formed in 2002. In 2007, um, the time of day watering restriction was expanded and we'll, we'll talk about that. I will get into a little bit of a deeper dive on time of day watering in just a moment. In 2012, our irrigation ordinance was once again amended to include mandatory twice weekly watering. Um, and again, we'll get into that in just a moment as well. I oversee a staff of 10. Uh, here in water conservation. We have a $4.2 million annual operating budget that was just passed by council. Um, and interestingly, I do get this question, water conservation was in the water utility since 2002 through 2017. In 2018, we actually merged with the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability, but we are fully funded by Dallas Water Utilities. So you will hear me reference uh, the utility throughout the presentation because we have a very close collaborative working relationship with them, of course. Next slide, please. All right, so time of day watering in Dallas, as I mentioned, um, has been part of the water conservation ordinance since 2001, since the ordinance was first adopted. At that time, it was June 1st through September in an effort to reduce um, you know, peak demand in the hottest times of the year, which were the summer months. And at the time, of course, and still now, it prohibits wasteful landscape irrigation practices. In 2007, we expanded that, the dates to include April 1st and run all the way through October um, because some of the months that lead into the summer and then, then come out of the, the summer are unseasonably warm in Texas and getting warmer, as many of the presenters have mentioned. So um, that expansion has had a very favorable impact on our gallons per capita daily. Uh, but again, the time of day watering restriction in Dallas prohibits operation of automatic irrigation systems um, with broken misaligned missing heads, um, irrigation during any form of precipitation. So if it's raining, if it's snowing or sleeting, obviously we don't wanna see our customers irrigating at that time. They're in violation of the ordinance if they are. Um, it also requires rain and freeze sensors be installed on all automatic irrigation systems. If you don't have that or if it's not functioning properly, you're in violation. It also prohibits excessive runoff resulting from overwatering. And, and we all know here in the conservation business that many of our customers think their lawns need more um, watering than they really do, which results in um, excessive runoff. And in the city of Dallas, you're in violation if that's happening on your property. Um, and also the watering of impervious areas such as sidewalks and streets. Next slide, please. 
So uh, Micah mentioned to the drought of 2010 through 2012, um, and, and many of you were in conservation at this time. So you, you may remember 2011 being the driest year on record for the state of Texas. Um, here in Dallas, we were in drought response in, by 2011, as was most of North Texas. In fact, um, we, we were only allowing maximum twice weekly watering at that time as in drought response. Uh, as were most of the cities around us, most of the utilities, and, and even some of our neighbors to the north were only allowing irrigation once per week. So the decision was made at that time um, in the utility with the support of Dallas, uh, Dallas's mayor at the time, and also in support of, um, with the support of the mayors from surrounding cities uh, that we would adopt permanent mandatory twice weekly watering and that schedule. And with the support, uh, it was approved by city council in April and went into effect April 23rd of 2012. Next slide, please. Okay, so here is the maximum twice weekly watering schedule for the city of Dallas. Um, we promote this through bill inserts, through social media. It's on our website, savedallaswater.com. The weekly watering schedule is based on the last digit of your address, as you can see. Non-watering days in the city of Dallas are Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays. So no matter what your address is, those are non-watering days. Of course, the watering schedule applies to automatic irrigation systems and hose and sprinklers, um, but hand watering is allowed on any day at any time. And um, as you know, variances are an important component because we understand that there are certain circumstances that occur where properties cannot be fully irrigated within 24 hours, for example. Uh, golf courses fall into that category typically newly installed landscapes, sod is our most, you know, most of the variance requests that we receive are newly installed landscapes and or sod, um, and also special circumstances. So if a place of worship, for example, if their watering day is on a Sunday, that would be problematic because obviously they have uh, parishioners or, you know, people coming um, throughout the day, and we will consider a variance for circumstances such as that. So before we move on to the next slide, I, I want to talk a little bit about enforcement up until, you know, up until we moved to uh, enhanced enforcement, which I'm about to get into. So uh, at this time, the way that we enforced the time of day and mandatory twice weekly watering restrictions were through friendly reminder letters. And I know these letters very well because when I started in water conservation, um, it was one of my tasks to actually send out the letters. So to receive the reports and send them out. And we would receive complaints through 311, which is our non-emergency system, uh, code compliance. And so I would collect all of them and send out these letters. But at the time, you know, you have to think back to, you know, eight years ago, you know, technology was not where it is now. And so we didn't have a way to really document um, offenders. You know, we people would call and say that they saw that. Sometimes they weren't exactly sure where. It was just at an intersection between this and that. It just became very problematic to, you know, to to accurately pinpoint where the offense was taking place. Um, and then we'd send the letters out, and there'd be customers that, of course, would adamantly deny it. And and sometimes perhaps they were right, you know. Um, but it just came that we were mailing out. I was mailing out letters to the same sort of offenders over and over. So we knew um, that something had to change. Next slide, please. So then began enhanced enforcement of the ordinance. And this began in 2016. Uh, what enhanced enforcement is, is a collaboration between Dallas Water Utilities, which I mentioned we work very closely with in conservation, uh, and Community Code uh, Services, which is our code enforcement department here in the city of Dallas and code inspectors assist us in identifying customers that are violating either the twice weekly and or the time of day watering restrictions here in the city of Dallas stipulated in the water conservation ordinance. So they also help us in enhanced enforcement. So as opposed to the friendly reminder letter that used to be sent out in the mail, now the, uh, the enforcement is stricter. And so if you violate the conservation ordinance, you can receive possibly a civil citation uh, with an associated fine. And again, the guidelines are just simply to adhere to the maximum twice weekly watering schedule as follows. There's no watering on non-watering days, as I mentioned, uh, no watering between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with the expanded dates of April 1st through Halloween, October 31st. Of course, hand watering, drip irrigation is always, uh, is always permitted on any, on any day at any time. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so this is how it works. So water conservation's operating, operating budget has a funding in it that funds the equivalent of two full-time positions in code compliance's budget for enforcement of the ordinance. Um, what we noticed was many of the violations were actually occurring in the off hours, so not normal hours that code enforcement officers would be out and about and able to, uh, to enforce the ordinance. Many were occurring late at night, some early in the morning. So we found that customers were typically scheduling, uh, you know, con their controller, right, for certain days and certain times, very early in the morning or very late at night, and, you know, setting it and then just essentially leaving it. And so we knew that we had to have some enforcement in, in kind of non-typical operating hours. And that's when enforcement, enhanced enforcement began to include overtime for code compliance officers to be out in those, in those times. So what happens if a customer violates the ordinance? Well, the first thing is a yard sign is placed uh, at the right of way adjacent to the property. So commercial, industrial, residential, doesn't matter. But also a notice of violation, uh, a warning letter, if you will, is mailed to the customer. They're given three days from the date that they receive the notice to abate the offense. And I'll show you the sign in just a second. It's wildly popular, as you might imagine. Um, it, it definitely, uh, some of our customers are pleased with the sign and understand the reasoning for it. Some, not so much. And, and again, you'll see it in just a second. But, it, but what it provides is two layers of notification. So, um, you know, it, it is possible, I suppose, that mail can get lost or misplaced or sent to the wrong place, but it's very difficult to overlook a yard sign that is uh, adjacent to your property there at the right of way. Um, and so the, so the customer is given three days to abate the offense. Um, a code inspector there will reinspect the property within two weeks of the first offense typically on the same day and about the same time. And the reason for that is because, as I mentioned, it typically is a pattern. Um, customers that, that receive it and have a broken sprinkler head, for example, and didn't know it immediately abate it. They fix it and then they're in compliance again, no problem. But for a controller to be scheduled and, and just left um, and it's, it doesn't adhere to the watering schedule, we find that is a pattern of behavior. So that is why the code inspector goes out about the same day, about the same time. Um, if the violation remains after the reinspection, a civil citation is issued. It is $350 for the first offense and then another $36 uh, that goes into a fund, the Dallas Tomorrow Fund, which supports public policy efforts on critical water issues. Um, now, if the code enforcement officer goes out and the violation has been abated, then the customer is deemed in compliance and, and no harm, no foul, we, we go on about our business. And of course, the sign the customer can remove and they do remove immediately upon returning to their property. Um, but again, like I said, it's just kind of a two layer way to communicate with the customer that they that they can't really miss. Um, additional offenses. So if the same property is observed violating the water conservation ordinance a second or third or so forth time, um, at any time during the 12 months after the first offense, then another civil citation is issued and they are separate civil citations. They aren't, they aren't just one and, um, and it's without warning, it's via mail. The maximum fine can be up to $2,000, which is determined by a judge. Um, and in a moment, we're going to talk about results. You know, that, that really is a key for me is, is the sort of the data that supports how effective is this enhanced enforcement. And we'll talk about that in a second. Next slide, please. So this is the sign that I mentioned. Uh, it's on a, a, a wooden stick and it's staked into the ground. It's a typical, you know, uh, garage sale sign kind of size, if you will. Um, and, you know, I find it to be very sort of non-threatening and just almost cheeky and friendly. I, I would say that some don't receive it that way. And perhaps if it were in my yard, I, I maybe would not, but it certainly is effective, which really is, is my goal at the end of the day is to just help inform customers in a non-threatening way and also um, help them come into compliance as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. And then finally, right, like I mentioned, how effective is enhanced enforcement? Um, so for 2019, so RFY 2019 is October 1, 2018 through September 30th, 2019. Here are the results. Um, code compliance inspected 3,300. Um, they conducted 3,300 inspections. They issued a violations to about half of those. Um, and then citations issued were 85, which means 
that the vast majority of the customers that received a violation self-abated um, in the three days that they were given. And you, as you can see, the voluntary compliance rate for FY19 uh, was 95%, which is extremely effective. You know, there's always going to be that small percentage that feel, uh, you know, I pay my water bill and I can certainly use it as I see fit and I don't mind um, paying a civil citation uh, or an increased water bill, for example, but the vast majority uh, do comply uh, voluntarily and that's really what we want to see. And I, I also put safety incidents on there. Sometimes I'm asked if code officers um, are confronted perhaps with dangerous dogs or aggressive customers who might be angry, for example. You know, fortunately, we've not had that. Um, it, it is really done in such a manner that's really more to inform. Um, and to that effort, code compliance and water conservation meet with each new code compliance class so that conservation staff can educate the code compliance officers that are new to the job on what to look for, what is a violation, really the manner in which to, you know, really educate the customers and, and, and bring them up to speed if they, if they need that, to guide them to our SaveDallasWater.com website with all of the information there that they could possibly need. Um, so it's been a really positive, effective working relationship, I would say. Next slide, please. All right, so that's really all I have for you today. It's been my pleasure. Um, for any inquiries on City of Dallas, conservation staff, what we do, what we offer, please visit SaveDallasWater.com. And of course, I will be around for questions after the next presentation. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Andrew Cummings with New Brunswick Utilities. We're uh, a small town in between San Antonio and Austin. Uh, we're invited here today to talk about our drought enforcement programs. And uh, first and foremost, I want to say that we, we do use education before enforcement, but uh, we do have a, a pretty effective enforcement program that I'm happy to share information on. Next slide, please. All right, so to begin, uh, the, uh, the department that we work in is the Environmental Affairs Department. We handle the NBU's Energy and Water Conservation Programs um, as well as the, uh, the drought ordinance uh, enforcement. Uh, we also handle key accounts and uh, our newly evolved One Water Initiative. Uh, we're established in 2007 as far as our conservation program goes. We did have an emphasis on conservation before, but it was strictly only educational. I think a lot of people's stories start out just educational, uh, but then the, the community realizes the value of a, a standalone conservation program. And we're located at the uh, the new headwaters at the Comal. So a lot of people heard the Comal River, uh, Schlitterbahn tubing, lots of fun stuff. We have a new uh, a conservation education center being constructed there. Next slide, please. Okay, so right off the bat, our enforcement methods, our drought ordinance, which is a, a city ordinance, so just the same as uh, running a, uh, a stop sign, <coughs> excuse me, uh, gives us a few different tools that we can use to help enforce these, these drought rules that we've established. So uh, from patrolling to issuing violations, uh, we, we maintain irrigation regulations and landscape requirements, just to name a few. Next slide, please. So the drought ordinance, like I said, our department was established in 20, uh, 2007, which was exactly the same time as the ordinance was constructed. So it's kind of a hand in hand. It since has been revised uh, three times, 2010, 2014, and most recently 2019. Uh, so all the enforcement methods are written and interpreted by NDU and the New Braunfels City Council. Uh, it, it is actively revised for clarity because when, when rules are written, occasionally they are a little muddled and uh, we do have people that may interpret it a different way. So we, we actively go back and, and check those. Uh, but we also revise them because of the state of the area. So New Braunfels, if, you, if you're unaware, we are the uh, third fastest uh, growing population in the nation from 2010 to 2019. Uh, population increased 56.6% uh, during those years, so quite a bit. And then that drought, uh, drought ordinance gives us some drought management tools. So it establishes the stage restrictions based on our Edwards Aquifer Authority mandates. Uh, we also monitor J-17 well for trigger, uh, trigger points. Uh, it mandates watering rules. And so once we go into these different stage restrictions, you know, there are different sets of rules as, as many people have already in their communities. But then it also maintains some building requirements. So, uh, you know, different kind of landscape outlines. 
uh, building, you know, in regards to water conservation, uh, it, it's all in there. And NBU, we, we do maintain five different stages of drought, including a non-drought, which a lot of people call year round. We call it non-drought. Um, it's one of those, one of those clarity things that we've, we've experienced. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. All right. So the, the first tool that we, that we utilize using our drought ordinance is our active patrol. So we have NBU staff, uh, that actively enforce the ordinance, uh, run around in NBU March cars any time of the day, any day of the week. You know, we, we patrol, um, all hours of the day, really. We, we have staff that come in at midnight, patrol all the way until 8 a.m. As you can probably guess, a lot of the irrigation goes off in the middle of the night. And we, we need to, to be able to, to keep a lid on that. And so some of the violations that we inspect for, you know, of course, wrong day, if we have a, the, what, what did you call it? A, a maximum two day, uh, non drought ordinance. So, uh, our customers can water odds and evens Mondays and Thursdays or, or Tuesdays and Fridays with weekends and Wednesdays being off limits. Uh, but when stages go into a more escalated effect, we do limit those down to one day and then even once every other week uh, uh, watering schedule. So the wrong day, the wrong time of day, our customers can water all the way up to 10 a.m. and then again after 8 p.m. until midnight on their day. And then wrong week, like I said, once we get into a stage three and a stage four scenario, uh, like we were with a lot of other, a lot of other communities between 2010 and 2014, 15, uh, we were in some sort of a, a drought stage just about that entirety of that period. And then, of course, our water waste issue that it consists of about 70 percent of the of the violations that we process. Uh, the, the photo here shows what I'm talking about, about water waste, in case you're unaware. You know, of course, we want the water to stay on the property. No pooling, no running off, no spraying into the street. I think it's a lot of common sense. But, of course, you know, irrigation systems. Uh, they, they move, uh, you know, of course, power outages, things like that can cause these issues. And so we, we do try to keep a lid on that. All of the staff that we utilize are ordinance designated conservation officers. Uh, they are designated through the ordinance, uh, via, the, via our CEO. So they do have to be designated. Um, they, not just any NBU employee or any city employee can actually process a violation. Uh, we have a small team of five. We're, we're expanding very quickly with population, uh, but only those five people can actually send you a violation that could stand in court. And then, of course, the, the photos that we do take are time stamp, date stamps, uh, just for, for customer education to show them, hey, we, we saw this at your property. Uh, you know, maybe they can get some, some kind of a reference of landmarks where it's happening if they're unaware. And then, of course, we can also use these photos in municipal court if it ever does get to that point. Next slide, please. So assessing the violations. Uh, we call them violations. Technically, they are surcharges uh, because they're applied to the, the customer's water bill. And so if you think, uh, if it goes onto a customer's water bill, they have to pay it. And if they, if they refuse to pay a water violation, it will go to a, a, a cutoff or non-pay. It's just the same as if you don't pay your water bill. And so we found that is more effective than sending a separate, separate fine, as it were. And so that's why it's a surcharge. But the violation structure, it all falls within a 12-month period. And so what I have here is, you know, starts with a warning, uh, goes to $25, $250, uh, $500, and then we really get into some to some serious issues. Uh, we'll compound that $500 with a termination of water service. So if they have an irrigation meter uh, separate, which is a mandate that we have, uh, we'll cut that off altogether. If they don't have an irrigation meter, we can and have before cut off their water service altogether at the property. And then if that doesn't ring through, then we can take them to municipal court and, and let them follow through with that. It is important to know, though, that with residential customers, the full violation process has a 99.96 effectiveness rating, as you could probably guess with the uh, threat of a $500 fine and termination of water service. Uh, but most residential customers, uh, as in 90%, they never even get to a $25 level. So uh, we really feel like our violation structure stops at that warning, which serves as kind of a more of a firm education piece as compared to, say, a violation piece. Next slide, please. Next thing that our ordinance allows us to do is regulate irrigation systems. So we check for water conservation, irrigation efficiency, so on and so forth. 
Uh, it's in addition to the normal building requirements maintained through the city. The, the drought ordinance layers additional conservation standards for irrigation system installs. Uh, New Braunfels irrigation installation standards are just an echo version of the TCEQ minimum standards with additional requirements that are more practical for our area. So the requirements that we inspect for are as if they do have a separate irrigation system, which is mandated through the ordinance and the NBU water uh, water system policy. So if they actually connect to our water system, even outside of the city of New Braunfels or ETJ, they are still uh, required to have a separate irrigation meter, which has really helped us. Uh, it's helped us with enforcement, obviously, but it also helps us with, uh, with leak detection and reporting in general. Then of course, sprinkler heads must be four inches away from hardscape. They must have a rain sensor. Uh, no heads in terraces uh, less than five feet in width. And so if you're unaware, a terrace is just a strip of grass between a curb and a sidewalk. And then the system must be hydro zoned. So like hedge with like heads, like uh, landscape with like landscape uh, to try to get that, that water conservation up to the max. Next slide, please. And then our landscape requirements that we, that we enforce. So one of the big ones is our builder model home uh, uh, issues in our ordinance is if a builder has a subdivision, uh, at least one model home per subdivision must not exceed 50% turf grass. So it's what we define as a zero escape in, uh, in the ordinance. And that's really all it is. So we'll, we'll ask builders to not exceed that 50%. Anything after that 50%, they can do with what they want as long as it's not impermeable hardscape. So, uh, you know, we have builders that put in a lot of mulch beds, rock beds, things like that. Uh, but in our area, we are very prone to drought, and once we get into the drought, we tend to stay in drought for a number of months, if not years. And so this really helps us uh, try to use the builders as an example for potential home buyers that they don't have to buy a home that's just turf, turf, turf. Uh, they can get something that is more than just your standard builder package of sod uh, and and. You know, the, the picture here is actually a photo that we took of one of our uh, one of our homes in our area that is a, a shining example of what, what we're meaning by that. And then the new homeowner offerings. When a new homeowner buys a home uh, from a builder, that builder is required to offer a zero state package of not exceeding that 50%. Um, do they have to necessarily advertise it? No, we hope they do, but it's not been something that we've been overly successful about. Uh, and it tends to be something that's that's discussed after the fact. And those builders do come clean and they'll, they'll come and uh, do these packages for the homeowners, but it's just another way to reduce water consumption overall and help people avoid any of these violations that they may could run into if they had a traditional spray system that's bleeding out in the road or overspraying, anything like that. And then in stages three and four, all new landscapes, regardless of if it's a builder, if it's even a private residence or business, new landscapes may only consist of 50% turf grass. So, if they build a new home, uh, and that, that does not include checkerboarding, if they build a new home, it has to be either front yard or backyard that they can put inside, uh, but no more than that. And, of course, uh, if, they, if a homeowner require, requests a variance because of new landscape that they have, we will only give them 50% of what they've requested. And that's all, that's all discussed beforehand, and we hope that the, the customer reaches out to us before they actually install the grass, but sometimes that's not the case. But it does overall help promote drought-tolerant landscapes, uh, it avoids that potential irrigation water waste, as I said, but it also helps drive irrigation technology advances. And so we've seen an increase in multi-stream rotors, uh, high water, high efficient water uh, applicators for the irrigation systems such as drip, micro zoning, things like that. And so it really has helped us uh, kind of keep the lid on our ordinance uh, and, and keep those, those irrigation systems in check when it does come to enforcement. And so we've, of course, got a, a lot more that we do, but in regards to enforcement, that's, that's kind of us in a nutshell. So next slide, please, and I believe that is it. And I will hand it back to Ms. Jennifer for questions. All right. Um, Andrew, actually, I'll pick up. This is Denise. I'll pick up for um, question and answers. Um, while we're on that slide right there, this I am so impressed that um, New Bronzeville has worked with and it has a building model home ordinance or requirement. Um, th that is something I've never been able successful and getting traction with are the home builders. So 
tell us a little bit how this came about. Did you have to work with the Builders Association? Was it just something the city approved and put into their requirements? Um, kind of walk through a little bit of that. So maybe we can duplicate that here in North Texas. Absolutely. So, you know, to, to start with, it was just added into the ordinance in 2007 from the get go. Uh, we have approached the, the Builders Associations, uh, Model Home, uh, not model, uh, homeowners associations as well to try to get the message out. But we do also enforce that each year uh, we send out an annual letter that that reminds the builders, hey, Uh, Andrew, we've lost your sound. There you go. Okay, kind of jump back. We lost your sound. Yes, ma'am. So, yeah, we, we, we send out these letters. Still can't hear you. Still can't hear me. There we go. Now we got you. Got you back. I'm sorry. I'm having connection issues. Uh, yeah, so we, we do inspections. We send out letters to make sure that these builders are in, are in check. We do have builders that have several subdivisions, you know, across town. Uh, that each one of those subdivisions does, they do have to have a model home that, that meets these requirements, even if it's just one. <clears throat> so you can imagine that, you know, if a, a builder has 15 subdivisions, theoretically, they also have 15 uh, model homes that meet these requirements. So it, it's a really great thing to try to showcase to a potential buyer, um, and it keeps the water use down in, in that neighborhood, just by example. So it, it's been fairly successful for us. But we absolutely love to get the message out. We've used contests. Um, you know, different kinds of mailers just to let customers know that this is a thing. Um, and, you know, it's, see, it, it is kind of rewarded in some cases. You know, when we have, we've had contests, we've offered pretty, pretty decent prices. Uh, we've had drought, drought tolerant landscape calendars that uh, customers can be in and we, we issue out to the entire city. So uh, we have a lot of fun with this and it's not, it's not a, uh, a very, it's not been a very difficult thing for us to get around, I would say. This has been kind of one of the low-hanging fruit that has kind of come, uh, come fairly easy for us. Denise, I think you're on mute. Now I was on mute, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, let me ask Holly a question. Uh, you mentioned um, the data that you use to back up your enforcements. Um, do you share this with your council or is this an internal evaluation? And how do you arrive at your data? Give us, because data is really important. So I wanna kind of get this information out there to the attendees. Right, thank you for the question, Denise. Uh, absolutely, so in the city of Dallas Water Conservation, everything we do is data driven. It, it gives us an idea of how successful the programs that we currently have are, including enforcement and what direction we need to go if we need to tweak something or if we need something new. So in terms of enforcement, our data comes directly from code compliance officers. Uh, there is a manager who collects all of that. So, you know, each day that the code enforcement officer comes in, they turn in their reports and their, you know, what they, how many citations, uh, you know, they collect all of that for us. Absolutely, it's very important that it be accurate and transparent. Um, they send us an actual report where it's all been summarized nicely. We have a very close working relationship with them and we've been fortunate to have that since enhanced enforcement began in 2016. Uh, and then the second part of your question. So in, in the city of Dallas, uh, city council buy-in and support is really everything. I mean, everything we do requires city council approval and support. And so um, it, it, it behooves us really to keep them informed of what we're doing, what the results are, what we're finding, what's working, what's not. All of our programs, uh, the data since the inception of each of our programs, um, is presented in such a way that's compelling to them and that helps them understand how effective all of our programs are, not only across just their district with their constituents, but across the city in general. So um, we are part of an environmental sustainability committee. We brief the city council uh, on a variety of environmental issues once a month so that they're up to date on what we are doing. Those issues include conservation, zero waste, storm water, air pollution. There are lots of different issues. Um, and that's an opportunity to really share with them these data-driven results um, so that we can answer any questions that they have. And, and most importantly, we can get information from them because who knows their constituents better than they do? No one. 
Um, and so when we look at data, we GIS map it across the city, as I mentioned, and across districts. And really what that tells us is not only how effective the programs are, but also the gaps where, where, where those programs haven't laid over. Why is that? Who are those customers? Is it because uh, they don't qualify for some reason? Is it because they're not getting the word out? You know, we're not doing our due diligence to get these programs to them. You know, we never want to be less than proactive and wait for customers to come to us. Our goal is to take our programs out to where they are. Um, and so that data allows us to answer and to ask a lot of questions and city council is an integral component of that. Perfect. Well, I wanna thank you both for your presentations. Um, Holly and Andrew, there are additional questions. We're out of time right now for this segment. So if you would please stick around and answer, respond back to some of those questions and answers and be sure to have it to all the um, attendees so everyone can read it. And thank you again. And I'm gonna hand it over to Jennifer. Thank you Hi, so much. Everybody. Thank you. Um, lots of interesting discussions. Thank you very much, Denise. You're a very good moderator. We appreciate you.